Hello and welcome to the SBK Betting Podcast. My name is Tom Collins and I'm usually sat in the tipping chair right now listening to this intro, but today I am presenting Filling the Boots of Jess Stafford, who is away on holiday. It's a truncated schedule this week. We'll be covering some great races, but there's only two of us on the podcast. I'm joined by Racing TV pundit and punter James Millman. Hopefully you can provide a few winners along the way. As I mentioned, the highlight this week is the Dublin Racing Festival. We'll be covering two races from Leopardstown, as well as a couple of featured races from Sandown. And as I mentioned, hopefully we can pick a, few, a fair few winners. Now, let's start with the 150 at Sandown. It's the listed contenders hurdle, a race that was used as a prep for Bouvet Dare en route to winning the champion hurdle in 2016 and 2017. There isn't a horse in here of Bouvet Dare's calibre, is there, James? No, it's a race that Nicky normally uses his own private gala, which was actually viewed by spectators. But this year it's a competitive affair, but probably for the wrong reasons. I think uh, the quintet, there's all reasons to oppose them. Song for someone, he's a horse who the form figures actually look pretty good, but his attitude is arguably a bit questionable the last twice. He never travelled at Aintree when pulling up at the back end of last year. Good second behind uh, Jess's buzz after Ascot. And then I put him up on, on the pod at Cheltenham uh, last time out back in December, and he did not travel a yard. He looked totally disinterested at the beginning and actually flew up the hill and nearly beat Guard of Dreams. It's just a big question mark what song for someone's going to turn up. So I'm going to have to go elsewhere. Guard Your Dreams, for me, is the most solid. Uh, he's been consistent all season. Arguably, two and a half is his best trip, but dropped back to 2-1. He did beat Song for Someone at Cheltenham. I thought he ran well in the rail kill behind Stormy Island. And ultimately, he always runs his race. So he is solid. Goshen rarely ever turns up in a good frame of mind. Personally, I might have switched the more brothers around. I might just give Josh a go on Goshen, because for me, uh, at Lincoln in particular, he runs to hang so badly right. Jamie was bolt up right in the irons. He um, didn't have much control of him. He was quite lucky that, that the pack didn't really put away. I thought Keith Donahue probably should have kicked on sooner on his inside and Darvis star and, and brewing up a storm ended up claiming them both. But he is dodgy, but his best form, certainly even in the last 12, 15 months, we give him a little bit of a squeak. Obviously, when he beats Song for Someone at Wing Canton, um, where he actually destroyed him the king well shows you how good he is so that trio that had to market they're all they're all dangerous um, but they've all got their question marks the other two global citizen it looked signs of, of a real good effort at Haydock last time but I felt it was a kind of bit of a pace collapse Tommy's Oscar sat well off the early pace global citizen looked like he'd have a great chance in the home straight and he did just tire in the closing stages that was his best effort for a while but he's so in and out his form sometimes he runs okay sometimes he runs absolutely shocking Jesse needs to improve and Hunter's call is, is 12 year old so it's a strange little race it's a probably going to be a better view in contenders hurdle than normal but I'm just edging for the consistent one guard your dream yeah guard your dreams the currently the five to two joint favorite along with some for someone uh, with SBK I can certainly see your case there James um, he is the most solid horse in the race there's no doubt about it it's just the trip that's the negative for me um, I think he needs further and in a small field maybe they do go hard early i mean global citizen who is going to be my tentative selection in the race at the prices could go off as like a hair out in front gosh and maybe second and then the other three runners in behind and that could suit guard your dreams but i'm going to stick with global citizen just in case he gets the easy lead up in front he can kick clear this is his second run after a wind up which is an angle that i like to use from punting and the likes of Goshen and Song for Someone are just horrible rides. I mean, I'm not a jockey. James, you've obviously ridden a, a fair few horses in your time. Um, I can imagine if you were going out there to ride one of those two, you'd be thinking, God, I'm going to earn my fee here. Yeah, Jamie got interviewed by, by Matt Chapman straight after uh, Lingfield. And you could see Jamie was not, not amused by, um, by what happened. I, d- I just wonder if he feels like he's lost the battle with Goshen because Goshen keeps winning that hanging battle. I mean, we've seen him run up a trap a few times. We've, we've not seen, apart from the Kingwell uh, last year, the Goshen that was going to bolt up in the triumph and he looked so good. And like I say, um, Josh actually rides um, the owner's similar stable mate, I think in the first, um, shall we have one more? And I saw Josh win that on his bumper debut and Jamie hasn't gotten quite as well with him in two hurdle starts. And then Josh is back on board for the first time in the open. I know that Ross actually quite liked that horse um, going forward for the opener at Sandown. So for me, I just thought maybe try something different. You're keeping it in the Moore family. Um, Jamie's obviously ridden them every single time, nearly. I think Jamie uh, Josh might have ridden them once. But it just didn't look like a partnership that was gelling. And you mentioned some for someone. Aidan Coleman's had to work pretty hard on him the last few times. He's just looked 
lazy and, and enthusiastic a couple of times to me. So it's a it is a tricky race, and and like you say, your choice, Global Citizen, at his peak, and he has got a lot of ability. He's dangerous, but that's because he's only got the mark of one three six. He is taking on the classy horses again, but it's an intriguing little race. Yeah, exactly. And um, just to briefly touch on Goshen before we move on to the next race, you think jockey change? I think they should go over fences. Why not? Give him a go over yeah, fences. That is a brave, you're a brave, brave jockey riding him over. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've never ridden a horse before, and you, you might be able to tell from that answer. But sometimes, you know, the, the bigger obstacles spark some, some life into these kind of enigmatic horses. And Goshen showed in the past in the Triumph Hurdle that he had the talent to be a, a real star, star. So maybe fences could be the thing to uh, the catalyst to further improvement. Now, Moving on to the next race, uh, Sandown, the 220, the featured race at Sandown, the grade one Silly Isles Novices Chase. This race has been won by a five or six year old eight times in the last nine years. But if that trend is to continue this year, then outsider Gladiator Allen will have to come out on top. I personally can't see that happening. I'm not sure right, James. However, the market has it. It's a two horse race between some smart improvers, Lom Press for Venetia Williams and Pick Dorhey. Do you like one of those two, James? Well, I was going to say that was use of stat alert. <laughs> of the day, but it's probably actually interesting that all the four other seven year olds have had issues, which is why they haven't won or in this race as a five and six year old. Long press the leg injury in France, I think he got picked up quite cheaply before reappearing last season after nearly two years off the track. Um, picked Ore, his jumping falls apart. Mr. Coffey, he's consistent enough, but probably needs to improve in the bare form. Fugitive, we don't see him that often. Um, and Gladio Allen's got a few jumping issues. Uh, so it's one of his kind of intriguing races. I like Lon Press. Loved him when he won at Exeter. One two eight when he beat Gunsight Ridge, and I thought Venetia would have a nice handicap plan and and plot her way up through the two mile handicaps and uh, further. But in the end, she went straight to a graduation chase at Ascot, where he was the worst in at the weights, but he went off six to five favourites. That shows you how good Venetia thought he was, and she was absolutely spot on. Beat Legends Ride thirteen lengths, and then at Cheltenham in the, the trial for the festival itself in the Dipper. One pretty easy. The Gansing Queen was getting plenty of weight, the five pound mayor's allowance, and um, he just destroyed the field. I wouldn't have been surprised if she waited and kept them fresh for, for Cheltenham, but she throws the dice again. The quicker ground, I suppose, is the, a little bit perhaps of a, of a worry that he did win on good ground at Chepstow, uh, but I think he's, he's pretty good to be honest, Tom. Yeah, no, I do too. Um, this is kind of billed as a match race, as I mentioned. Long press currently five to six with SBK, picked all he 15 to eight. Look, it's not going to be the same match that we saw with Shishkin and Anagamin a couple of weeks ago, but these are two smart horses. I'm also surprised, like you, um, that Venetia Williams is running long press again before Cheltenham. I thought maybe going left-handed, well, not maybe, definitely going left-handed suited his jumping. Now, I'm in the same camp as you here, and I'm going to put up long press as well, purely on the basis that I think he's the most talented horse in the race. However, it might be a nervy watch for odds-on punters if he jumps out to the left like he did at Ascot. Um Look, Pickdor, he's not a, not a solid jumper by in his own right, to be honest. And Gladiator Allen, as you mentioned, is. And Mr. Coffey jumps like a bag of hammers, as Jerry Han, uh, Hannan would say. So, yeah, I think it's long press for me, but it's, it's going to be a nervy watch at uh, odds on. Yeah, and, and he did run at Sandown back in April, didn't he? At Lucy Turner, Redmond Cup, hurdle races, one at Chepstow, and he jumped badly left when he had that hurdle run there. So that is a little bit of a question mark. I suppose if you wanted to take him on, Pickdor, he's jumping is more of a bigger question mark for me because... He takes a few liberties and, and Sandown's railway fences in particular would be quite a test for him, of course. Yes, I completely agree. Uh, that's our coverage for Sandown. Let's move on to Leopardstown. And the first race we'll start with is the 210, the Irish Arkle. Here's another stat for you. This one's not useless, though. Not useless. Wo Excellent stuff. <laughs> Willie Mullins has won four of the last seven renewals uh, with top notches Underso, Duvan, Footpad, and last year, Energamine. He sends out half the field this time around and his Blue Lord is likely to go off favourite. Is he your idea of the winner? I'm hoping for a better start in, in the next one, TC, because as you mentioned, he's got the trio taking on River de Terre and they've all got good chances, but I felt that he could lose at least one of them to be a bit of a spoiler for River de Terre because I think Fernie Hollow was good enough to take him on and take her on at the front end at Leopardstown at the Christmas period. And I thought she ran well, but I think she's better against more inferior opposition and bowling out on the front. You've got St. Sam and Rachel Blackmore riding the apparent third string. He looks quite keen. I think Rachel might not have a lot of choice, but he could well end up being a bit of a spoiler for River Dato. And Blue Lord, who was okay over hurdles. He ran well behind Bob Ollinger at Nace in January. Third to appreciate it at the Dublin Festival. Was running okay, but well beaten when coming down in the Supreme. 
he seems to have excelled switching to the bigger obstacles. He's very impressive at Nace last time. He's four to one on, didn't beat a lot, but the style of it was pretty good. And he does appear to be the clean number one in the market. So pretty boring, but I think having that strong hand gives Willie Mullins a bit of an edge against Gordon Elliott's mare. And I think Blue Lord will be the one to, to pick up the pieces. Yeah, I completely agree. Two votes for Blue Lord here. Um, you, to my eye, he's been ridiculously impressive on both starts this year. I think he's a better chaser, personally, than Fernie Hollow. Um, Fernie Hollow could okay. even... Okay, I wouldn't have gone quite, quite that far, but obviously he's out now, so he's yes. definitely taken the mantle for the, the lead in Willie Mullins, I hope. Exactly. Fernie Hollow, I think, could progress into, into the leading um, two-mile chaser, but uh, at this stage, I, I prefer Blue Lord. Um, and Fernie Hollow, as you mentioned, beat Riviera Detail last time, so... With that standpoint, then Blue Lord has to beat Rudy Adetel in, in my mindset. Five-year-olds, Hort and Colour, he's intriguing. I don't really like St. Sam, as you mentioned, very keen. Could be the pacemaker in this field. So yeah, Blue Lord, who's currently available at six to four with SBK, is the vote for both of us. Um, the best race on Saturday it also comes at Leperstown and is at 315. It's the Irish Gold Cup. Now, here's another stat. Look, I've done my homework, James. Right, number three. Is this going to be one that actually <laughs> I think is, is useful? Probably not. Um, <laughs> this is another race that Willie Mullins has farmed with four winners in the last 10 years, most recently with Kenboy 12 months ago. Kenboy lines up again as he attempts to retain his crown, but he's a 10-year-old now. Do you think he's good enough to win again, James? I think he ran a cracker at Christmas. Guy went up at our just in front of him at Leopardstown. Obviously, he won it last year. He travelled nicely and he made all. We've obviously got Paul Nichols coming across the board and not taking Fred onto Cheltenham this year, well, not entering him anyway at this stage. And are they going to potentially spoil it up front? I'm taking a flyer because he probably won't get round. But a Styrian for Lange, for me, if he does jump, he, he's got a lot of ability. His jumping actually isn't that bad. It's just he does get one wrong and he ends up on the floor. Uh, but I thought he ran absolute cracker in the King George. Uh, tornado flyer for me was ridden to pick up the pieces and the pieces all fell into place perfectly for Danny Mullins and Tornado Flyer, whereas our steering for launch was ridden more forcefully by uh, Saturday's jockey, Brian Cooper. Rightfully so, because everyone was going on, don't give Brian an easy lead, make sure it's a strongly run King George, and then they all took it a little bit literally. And I just think if he gets round, he is an obvious one to, to win the race against, you know, he's got a U and an F in his last two starts, and then it's not exactly going to be a surprise if he does. But, but for me, I thought he was most talented in the field. Nella Indo, Robbie Power replaces, replaces Rachel Blackmore, and that might be a positive for me, TC. I'm not sure about your thoughts, but I'm not sure Rachel gels completely with a Manella Indo, and ultimately Jack Kennedy got a much improved performance out of him at the Gold Cup, even though he comes good at Cheltenham in March. And then what are your thoughts on, on that score? Yeah, it's intriguing, isn't it? Rachel Blackmore obviously rode up Utard um, in March, finished second to Manella Rindo. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, he hasn't run up to his best so far this year. Maybe they're looking for a catalyst again to an improved effort. And Robbie Power could be the guy to, to produce that. And Manella Rindo obviously bounced right back last year from a couple of disappointing or, or below par efforts to win at Cheltenham. Maybe he bounces back a month earlier this time around and wins the Irish Gold Cup. But you're taking a bit of a risk given he pulled up last time. He's going to be a pretty short price. Currently, he's four to one with SBK. So I'm not sure if I want to be taking that risk. Um, I don't personally like Frodon or Kenboy in this race. I think they're too short. Uh, Frodon's a horse that obviously is a massive fan favourite, isn't he? I don't think I've ever backed him to win. So uh, yeah, I'm on the opposite. Oh, you, missed, you missed the early SBK podcast where me and Ross were all over him at Down <laughs> Oil when uh, that was, for me, that was key that, that Paul was going out there to win. Yeah. Where the other horses were having their, their prep run first round of the season and, and I think Frodon was literally on his A game and then that was a, a top performance I was disappointed in, in the King George uh, mm. Frodon's very easy to get beat because you just you just take him on at his, his game and get him out of his rhythm but you need horses that to kind of have that vulnerability because you kind of ruin their own chances and I just thought you've mentioned Willie's stats he's got a strong hand once again if one does fall by the wayside going a little bit too hard he's always got horses to pick up the pieces and yeah, him and Ken Boy, they could be a little bit, bit feisty early on, Brani and, and Paul Townend. Yeah, exactly. And you've gone for a steering for Lange, who I, I could certainly see that case. He's a bit bit of an enigma with his uh, with his jumping, but I, I agree with you. He's so talented. He reminds me a bit of uh, the ill-fated master Tommy Tucker early in his career. He was a great jumper and then would just get one wrong and, and that would be the end of his race. 
Um, unfortunately, my mantra for punting is not to back horses that fell last time out. So I've had to swerve him, though I do think he's uh, got a great chance of winning. Instead, um, I'm going to be tipping one of other, one of Willie Munners' other runners, which is Jana Dill. Now, Ross Miller, who was supposed to be on this podcast, but unfortunately can't join us from Prague, was also going to put him up. So uh, I'm quite glad that he didn't steal my thunder on this one. Um, he's a big price. Nice right? big price, isn't it? Yeah, 16 to 1. I couldn't believe no, it. No odds on a weather shot here. <laughs> <laughs> not this week <laughs> yeah he, he made a steering for lunch look a bit slow last year over two mile four um at fairy house which if you just look back at that race it was quite intriguing because that steering for lunch looked the winner for, for the whole way and, and janadil just breezed past him with two fences to go now he hasn't won since which is a slight question mark and probably why you're getting you know 15 16 to one but he finished second behind Energamine last spring then he finished second behind alaho on a seasonal reappearance both very creditable runs Last time out was his first try at three miles. I thought he ran respectably uh, in the Savills chase. He wasn't beaten too far at all. And to me, as an each way alternative with dead eight runners, uh, Janadil look, looks the play. Yeah, well, we know he would like to keep his options open, but he really isn't sure about the trip for this horse because two, two and a half, three, the last three starts. And it's been a, arguably similar levels of form in, in each each start. And uh, I wouldn't disagree about your each way value there because, like I say, it's a race I think could just fall apart a little bit with Frodon going hard. From the front, but an interesting race, and again, good spectacle. And I'm looking forward to seeing the Dublin Festival on Sunday, or Saturday and Sunday. Yes, me too. It should be a, a cracking two days of racing, lots of clues as well. I think there are 11 or, or 10 or 11 winners that ran at the Dublin Racing Festival last year that went on to win at the Cheltenham Festival. So you're going to get lots of lots of clues um, regarding next month and the big showpiece meeting. OK, that does it for the featured races that we're covering. So you know what time it is. It's time for the nap and next best. Take it away, James. Yeah, it's an interesting weekend we featured four races which are probably going to be high on the agenda at Cheltenham but there's some quite good betting opportunities elsewhere and I like one for Venetia Williams at Sandown uh Lon Press I think will give her a, a pretty good uh day regardless but a horse who won nicely at Lingfield in the Winter Millions meeting that was Ferrero Bamboo who traveled nicely on the Chai Deutsch he produced him wide sailed on strongly down the outside he ran well by an editor Geet at Cheltenham but the key piece of form for me was at Sandown last March only 124 at a time, he's 140 now. He absolutely bolted up, so you know he handles these fences with a plum. Gunsight Ridge, I opposed him. Uh, what was that four weeks ago? He did get the job done, but for me, he's a bit of a weak finisher. Him and Bundarama first and second, they might just be vulnerable to a horse taking them on on Saturday. So, Ferro Bamboo is a nap, and then I'm sticking with my old friend, Mr. Maxwell, for the next best. Uh, his horses are always overpriced because he's the Corinthian amateur. He's riding better than ever, actually. He's given some good rides to horses recently. Cat Tiger was an absolute cracker at uh, Ascot uh, on SBK day. And I just felt that his horse, once again, is going to be overpriced. Dolphin Village, he's won his last two under David. He's gone up £10, but he produced a cracking effort to beat Kansas City Chief. He's around about 15 to 1, so he's an each-way angle for Saturday's action. He's the next best. Um, I think he'll be in the four, and Dave will give you a great run for his money. Yeah, so uh, James is now just to recap there. Ferrero Bamboo, 5-1 to one in the 115 at Sandown. And his next best is Dolphin Square, 16-1 to one in the 255. My nap is going to be at Leopardstown in the 245. Um, a horse called Dunboyne. Now, he's 6-1 to one with SBK currently. This maybe is a, a heart rolling overhead um, and thinking about future engagements because I've backed Dunboyne for the Potemps final at the Cheltenham Festival Anti-Post. And I think he might need to win this race or at least place to uh, to get into the race, depending on what the handicapper does, uh, the British handicapper does with his mark. However, I thought he shaped so well um, in the potential qualifier at Leopardstown over Christmas. He got a terrible ride that day, went right up the inside and there was just blockages everywhere. Just couldn't find a clear, clear run at them. But he wasn't beaten too far, being left off the same mark of 128. And I think it's really interesting, given that he probably needs to run a career best um, and maybe even win this to get into the, the potential final. And my next best, we've already covered it. Um, it's Blue Lord in the 210 at Leopardstown. I think he can enhance Willie Mullins' great record in the race. And six to four to me is a fair price about a horse who's far superior to his rivals. Before we go, I should let you know about SBK's offer. Um, any new customers can deposit £20. And if your qualifying bet is settled as a loser, we will refund your stake as cash, cash, note that, up to £20. Um, Jess will be back next week. Hopefully Ross will be too, if he's not in an airport in Prague somewhere. Um, as we preview the action from Newbury and Warwick, Best of luck with your selections this week, James. Hopefully a winning nap and next best. And thank you, everyone, for listening. See you all next week. <laughs>